So, commercial valuation or a bricks and mortar valuation? What is the big differentiator between the two of these? What makes a valuer value a property as a commercial property or a bricks and mortar valuation? The answer to that is an opinion. But before we get into that, if you're new to this channel, make sure you stroke that uh, like and subscribe button, really helps out the algorithms and you'll get notified with more content like this and other videos all around property investing mindset. And there's a few other things that you've got to tick the box of first to get a commercial valuation, but the main differentiator and the main thing is down to the opinion of the valuer that comes out that day and values your property. So I'm Harvey, I'm a remote property investor, and yesterday I uh, spent some time on the phone with Addicts, uh, <clears throat> Blake Burra, uh, discussing an exit from a bridging product we've got on a uh, on the seven bedroom ex guest house. So a big part of it's developed. We've got some other issues in between uh, that with the planners, which is for another video. I'll just discuss that and share that with you. Uh, share that with you uh, next week as we iron this out with the planners. But ultimately, all the same, because I'm on a bridging product, I want to start working out which is my exit plan from this bridging project. So who, what lenders do I place this with? And if we get get us through what we're planning to do with this, there's going to be the front part of the building is going to be a HMO and the back part of the building is going to be a flat. So if we proceed and get this this throw correctly it's not just a straightforward normal lender that will take that product because unless we split the title and separate the flat and get two different products on it but under one product you need certain lenders that's going to have a mixed use uh product but obviously the only discussions we've got with this is will it qualify as a commercial valuation or am i going to get just a straightforward bricks and mortar so i've already had a straightforward bricks and mortar from the surveyor uh from the bridger then they've not valued it on a commercial but the hope is obviously on a project like this i bought this purposefully hoping to get an uplifted commercial valuation so what is the difference between a commercial valuation and bricks and mortar let's let's explain that firstly so a bricks and mortar is based exactly on the bricks and mortar so what is that worth has a property bricks and mortar often gets tied to bricks and mortar valuations of a normal home so if you've got a normal three bedroom property you you turn the downstairs uh dining room into a bedroom put fire doors on there put some fire alarms in and you call it a hmo it, it won't often qualify for a commercial valuation. Uh, a commercial valuation is based on the income from the property. So when you get, if you walk down the high street, go down your local high street and you'll look at all the different buildings. The buildings on that high street are not valued as a bricks and mortar basis. They can be, but their valuation just as bricks and mortar is lower. They're valued on the income they generate as a commercial entity. So if you've got uh, if you've got Tesco's in there on a fifteen year or twenty year fully insuring, fully repairing lease, the value of that property and it's generating a really high cash flow. The value of that property is going to be a lot higher than the next door neighbour that potentially has got. Uh, mum, mum and dad grocery store in there selling the same products as Tesco's, but not as a solid as a tenant. So blue chip tenants, strong incomes, residual guaranteed income, not guaranteed, but the stronger the income is. So the higher the income, the stronger the tenant relate linked to that income, the higher the proper, the higher the valuation goes. And they work off a yield, they work off a multiplier. It's a bit backwards. So the, the, the lower the yield you get, the higher the multiplier of the valuation. So basically, if I get this right, I think this is, if you get an eight times, if you get an eight percent yield, you're going to get 10 times multiplier of the income. So you can quickly see if you, it needs to be done with assets that you can generate higher incomes from so uh, potentially not like you can't do it with service accommodation as far as i know with most lenders with service accommodation as just a single unit you can't buy a house and a service accommodation what the lenders want to see is this is a commercial use building so hmo's pass for this or if you bought a property and you you sort of split it into three different apartments and made it into a block of service accommodation and a, a, like an apart hotel sort of style thing, that would then qualify. But uh, HMOs qualify for this, but they have to be purposeful. Like the, the fabric of the building has to be changed so it can only really be used as HMO and not turned back to a normal house too easily. Otherwise, they will value it as a bricks and mortar. So if you've got an income generating property that generates 30K a year, you can get the valuation based on that 30K, not the bricks and mortar. You could take a property that you've you've bought for 150K or, or, or like the property we've got at the moment is probably going to generate 
uh, uh, upwards of that sort of income, and it was bought for 125k. The bricks and mortar value is about 225. The spend we're spending on it's probably going to be about just over two. So we. To, to recycle momentum investor, I ideally need the bricks and mortar value. But that said, I am comfortable with it if I don't get that bricks and mortar value. So if they say to me, right, okay, we're only going to give, if they don't give me the commercial value. So if they say to me on this project, it's only a bricks and mortar, it's going to leave a bit more cash in than I wanted. But the exit plan of this, and this is what you always got to plan for, the worst case scenario. The exit plan for this was, okay, the higher income is going to generate that cash back pretty quickish anyway, then I have that higher income for the future going forward anyway. So I'm comfortable if I have to leave a larger chunk in there than I hope. I would like to get the commercial valuation. And also another reason, I'm not always comfortable with all commercial valuations because quite often on HMOs, if you take that above the bricks and mortar and it don't work as HMO anymore, like they do double cancel tax or they tax cancel tax each room or they put a licensing on each room and it no longer operate can operate as a HMO, you've got to figure out what's your exit. You're lending on commercial valuations is a lot higher percentage and obviously you're going to take it above the bricks and mortar value in many cases. So you've got to make sure there's, for me, I want an exit. So on the one I'm doing at the moment, the exit of that is even if this rented as individual units, as ASTs, that will still wipe its face on the higher valuation and the higher lending that I'm going to gear against this. So I've got that exit plan. If it works as how I want it to do as plan A, it's going to have a higher income aside that as well. So always be cautious when you're going to commercial valuations. But basically, the, the banks, first of all, the tick boxes they've got to tick to qualify is it's got to be a purpose HMO. And what we mean by that is basically you've got to have potentially on suites in there, all on suites. Uh, it's got to be changed. The fabric of the building has got to be changed so it does look just like a HMO and it couldn't be rented out to a normal family. Uh, the project I'm doing at the moment is definitely qualifies for that. But then we were talking yesterday and it was like, what then qualifies you beyond that once the building qualifies for it how comes some buildings get this and some don't and it is an opinion and them opinions can be linked to things outside of the property so the property can tick all the boxes the income can be right the the fabric of the building can be changed right but the opinion of the person that turns up might just might not like hmos might not like investors i had a we had a mixed use building had a, a shop in it and two uh, apartments what we converted a commercial conversion and the guy that come out, and we, we only had two lenders in the market that would lend to us as well because it was a mixed use and the shop element, not a lot of appetite for that with the lenders. And the time we loaned against this, there's only two lenders. One of them wasn't really interested, and so we really was narrowed down. One of them was kind of interested, but their rates was ridiculous, and we was narrowed down to one uh, lender. And when the surveyor come out, he wasn't like he just wasn't keen on me. I, I, I lost the battle of trying to win him over. And he also, you could tell, he was an investor himself, and one a struggle to do momentum investing. So his first words to me was, this don't work anymore. I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to pull your money out. You can't do that anymore. And I was thinking, well, you actually can because I've just done it on a property, literally a, a minute, maybe two minute drive up the road and we got it valued by your company. And the reason we, your company's here, because we did get a panel to choose for from when we choose the panel who, who to uh, value this. The reason I chose your company was because your last guy valued this other one uh, where we needed to be, but the last guy didn't turn up on it because this was a different. This was a mixed use one, and the other one was just a title split. So this guy's opinion was very different from the other guy's opinion, and his attitude towards what we were trying to do was very different. So you're 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 massively battling against that. You're battling against people's opinions, their attitudes. Some some surveyors don't like just investors in general, and they're earning money, and they think they they get. Well, I, I dare to say this: they get a little bit bitter, like thinking, "Well, oh, look at you earning this money, and I'm here just." grafting away kind of thing so a little bit jealousy sinks in sometimes hope no surveyors are watching this but also some surveyors don't like hmos they like they might live in the area and think this impact's not nice in my area i do not like hmos there shouldn't be more hmos you're taking away the family homes so you're dealing with these other outside influences absolutely massively when it comes to you you uh, get in valuations, you, especially when it's more commercial ended one and it's not straightforward bricks and mortar. Straightforward bricks and mortar is easy to find comparables in the area that you can just evidence to them and say, look, this is what it's worth because this is what other things are sold for. When you're looking at more commercial stuff and HMOs and, and the mixed use buildings, there's not always a obvious 
comparable against that. So again, then you're going in, it's called the Red Book Valuation. You're going into their personal opinions, which is a minefield, basically. It's an absolute minefield. So when you're looking, commercial valuation sounds super sexy, helps you get momentum invested and helps you refinance lots more money out. But always go into there with your B plan. What is the worst case scenario? What happens if they don't give you a multiplier of your income? What if they actually give you, as I said, the lower the yield, I think the, l the lowest yield is 6% yield. So yeah, it's six, you get 12 times multiplier. 7% yield, you get uh, 11 times multiplier. Uh, uh, and 8% yield, you get 10 times multiplier of income and so forth. So what if they give you only a six times multiplier is that still going to stack for where you want it to be what they don't give you a commercial they just, they just come out bear in mind commercial valuations cost you probably anything from sort of like a thousand to fifteen hundred quid quid where a normal valuation might cost you 500 quid so and like, just because you spent that money on that valuation doesn't mean they're going to come back and give you that valuation. So you've got to have all these factors in place. You've got to have these exit plans in place as well. But what I'll do is I'll keep you posted with my one. We've not got past this battle with the 101 objections from the neighbours yet. So I'll keep you in the loop. What happens with it? I'll keep you in the loop if we get the commercial valuation. If we don't, I've already made peace with it. If we don't, I've already had a valuation, an estimated valuation of 225, which I think will force up because the spec we're doing. But I've already had an estimated 225 one. So I know that's my like my get out. If it's 225, I'm probably only going to have around a 25k uplift. The reason I was comfortable with that without going into that commercial valuation space was, as I said, because the income from it's going to be so high. So what most people look at when they're refinancing and they're trying to exit a property, like get their money back out of a property is they usually say, okay, let's, let's look at it on a normal buy to let. You might say, okay, I've bought this buy to let for uh 70k i've got 85k into it they've valued it 100k means i'm leaving 15k of uh i'm leaving 10k of my money in the deal uh i'm leaving 10k of my money in the deal how many years does it take of income to get my 10k back that's what a lot of people usually do so if you're earning 5k a year it's like right two years i've got my money back so the same multiplier happens on this on, on this so where the income's so high i've probably got the same length of time get my money back as i would have if i've got a good valuation if i get a good valuation i've got my money back quicker and the income also so, so that's an absolute bonus but i can make peace i can tie the return i'll get on the capital i'll tie up in now is still very much worth like what i'm doing and obviously the future incomes that gains from that before i hit my break even point so i hope you found it useful put in the comments uh we were talking yesterday with alex about some of the crazy valuations had over the years i've had some valuations where uh, i had a value value come out on a 63k property and valued it at 62 you're like really and the bank won't lend on it you're like really and, and i mean the, the investor is foreign investor they had to either top up a thousand pound or walk away from it they decided to walk away and it's like really a thousand like your opinion is a thousand pound now it's not like it's 20 grand out and like the thing is though they're all scared about their indemnity insurance banks have heavily put it on to these surveyors uh to to get this right and if they get it wrong it's on them and because in the last recession in 07 there so many like surveyors still getting sued and the banks have really put that heavy on them uh and again some of the banks influence that point of view with them like i, I had a guy that I helped out with getting some bridging on a personal property he bought he bought a property around half a million he spent I think about 180k on it. He got told that would be valued at about 900k once it was finished. Uh, it was his own home, and he got a bridge on it to do the work and then exit it on a normal product. Then it was Virgin, by the way. I can't remember who the bridge was, but Virgin come out afterwards uh, to like to give him a normal buy to not buy to let home residential mortgage on it, and the valuer valued it at 825 or something like that. And he was like, "You value it was the same valuer, by the way." And he went, "You you your future." estimation like prediction of this would be 900 where's the difference and he said the difference is the bank the lender and he had actually done more work to it to he done then he told the bridger lend like the bridgers that he would do when he had the bridging product he, he said he was going to do it his spec he actually done it higher so then the same surveyor turned up and actually valued it 75k less and he asked him straight out, why did you value 75k less? It's actually a better spec than you expected it to be. Last time you, you anticipated it to be 900k and the market's not moved. And he said, it's just different lenders, different lenders, different criteria. They, they squeeze them differently. So you're really at the mercy of the surveyors and their opinions and, 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 and their views around this. So really go into this wisely, go into it understanding and having an exit plan just in case you don't get what you want. But that said, remember, if you don't evolve your ideas, you don't try things, you never live on your own terms. So evolve your ideas, live on your own terms and have a fantastic day, everybody.